Hi, my name is Trevor Montgomery. I've been married for nearly 22 years and my wife Robin and I have 10 children and young adults living at home with us right now. Yes, I did say 10 children. Some by birth, some by adoption, some fosters, and even a stray or two that we brought into our family fold simply because they were too young to be on the street, alone, afraid, angry, and hungry. That is where we've always stepped in. After more than 12 years of being foster parents and raising more than 50 special needs children, we've really seen a lot. Later, in more recent years, we've had several occasions to help after seeing 15, 16, and 17 year old kids, friends of our own children, who were living in back alleys behind local businesses, in abandoned homes, and even sleeping on park benches. That is simply unacceptable. I don't think people realize how many homeless people there are. And a lot of them are children, and they're at risk. We've never been the type to be able to just stand by, feel sorry for them, and then walk away having done nothing. Charity and love for your community starts right where you are, right now, wherever that might be. Have we ever been burned, hurt? and even stolen from and taken advantage of? Oh yeah, you betcha, of course. We've had a few bad seeds come through and we've paid the price. However, the benefits of helping others and those we have helped ease into adulthood from childhood far outweigh any risks we might have taken over the years while trying to help those young people who needed it the most. Let me tell you, with all these teens and young adults, as well as all their friends coming and going out to our house at all hours of the day and night, there is never a dull moment in the Montgomery family household. Also, with six of our ten children already driving, the front of our house must look like party central to our neighbors every day of the week. Well, let me tell you, they don't like it. <laughs> but what am I going to do? I've got eight drivers in my house, including myself and my wife. That's a lot of cars. Some of us have two cars. Hey, hey, I don't know what to say, but anyways, the problem is I really, in spite of all the family fun and the revelry and everything that's going on, I just really haven't felt like celebrating lately. Back in April 2006, April 14th to be exact, I gathered up my slightly, the nor larger, slightly larger than normal family, and we joined several other families that were caravanning together northward from California's Inland Empire, where we all live, to an RV-friendly campground located at the base of the hill where the Calico Ghost Town is located and has been holding silent vigil against the desert and closing mountains for dozens of years. Unfortunately, tragedy struck our group within the first two hours of arrival when, after finding brightly painted arrows heading directly towards a hole in the side of the mountain, my 14-year-old daughter and I dismounted from our all-terrain vehicles and decided to take a closer look at whatever marvels and wonders that painted arrow must lead towards. The hole itself appeared to be a man-made mine shaft, very, very much like the many we had already visited and explored at the Calico Ghost Town on many previous occasions. It never even occurred to me that this shaft would be so, so horribly different from all of the safe mines that we had seen while on official sightseeing tours of Calico, as well as other abandoned tourist mines and ghost towns across the country, of which we've seen many throughout the years during our family's many cross-country travels and adventures. But I guess my story really begins a week earlier with a man named Rusty Lassley and his little boy named River. Exactly seven days, one week prior to my accident, Rusty and six-year-old River were riding their quads in the very same area that my daughter and I had found ourselves to be in. More than likely, they found themselves wondering about that same brightly painted arrow that caused us to stop and take a closer look. Unfortunately for Rusty's family, his story did not quite end like mine. Rusty, having never realized he was walking into a cave that linked directly to a ventilation shaft and a 93-foot vertical fall, probably never even knew what happened. Rusty suffered a traumatic head injury and died at the scene. I hope and pray every day that he died instantly and was not forced to suffer at the bottom of that cold, dark shaft, wondering if he would ever be rescued. After witnessing his father's fall, 
brave little River not only left on his own to find his father some help, but at only six years old he succeeded in finding help to call 911, as well as having the presence of mind to help rescuers find and ultimately recover Rusty's body. My story went a little bit differently. After falling down that 93 foot shaft and coming to at the bottom of the hole, my first thought was of my daughter Caitlin and whether or not she might have fallen to the bottom of the same hole with me. I tried frantically to find her calling out her name and using my arms to reach around me and feel for her. Once I determined I had most likely fallen on my own and my daughter had probably left to go find help, I went about the business of determining just how bad my situation was. From my 10 years spent as an orthopedic specialist in the United States Army, as well as more than 13 years as a sheriff investigator with the Riverside County Sheriff's Department, I felt confident in my ability to survive. So long as somebody found their way back to me, in my precarious position, and fast. Within the first few minutes after waking up at the bottom of the shaft, I was able to complete a thorough self-diagnosis of my external and visible injuries at which time I realized the full extent of my injuries and just how bad a position I was actually in. Based on my self-assessment, I determined that at minimum, I had broken both my feet, both ankles, both legs, as well as numerous ribs, and my foot was partially severed and hanging together by a few threads of sinew and muscle. Worst of all, I knew almost immediately that I was paralyzed from the waist down and I would probably never walk again. In spite of the grievous injuries to my back and other areas, the true crisis at that moment was the blood spewing from my destroyed left foot. I knew immediately that with the amount of blood I was losing from my foot and ankle that stopping that bleeding was the most important thing for me to do at that moment. Despite my broken back, I managed to twist around enough to begin to uh, reach around and grab as much dirt and anything I could find. My idea was to begin packing dirt, mud, sediment, rocks, anything I could reach to push into the wound and help coagulate the blood and staunch the excessive bleeding from my foot. It was a weird thing to do, but it worked. The doctors later commented on how bizarre it was to have to pull so much dirt, rocks, and other sediment from my wounded foot and ankle. But I had managed to stop the excessive bleeding and considering how long it would be before I would be rescued, stopping that bleeding at that moment was the most important thing for me to do. Straining to twist my head enough to look back up the shaft the way I had come down, let me tell you, the darkness was absolute and complete. I could not even make out the slightest bit of light coming in from the entrance that I had walked into to get to where I was at now. In the deepening darkness of the bottom of the mine shaft, I now knew that getting out of this hole was going to be no easy feat. After about 45 minutes in what seemed like a lifetime of eternities, I heard the first signs of people arriving at the top of the mine shaft. The very first voice I heard was that of my beloved wife, Robin. She was crying and frantic and wanted to know how I was doing. Even with her five cell rechargeable mag light that she had, she still could not see the bottom of the shaft, nor could she see me crumpled up at the bottom. Her goal for the next 10 and a half hours was simply to keep me talking, keep me coherent, and keep me from closing my eyes and just letting nature take its course. During those many long hours, waiting for rescue teams to arrive, I experienced a series of the most amazing thoughts, visions, whatever you want to call it. I found that each time I felt my life slipping away to the darkness, my mind would continually go back to the same images and thoughts. Inside my home, from a high vantage point, as if floating above myself, I watched as I played on the ground with all my children. We were wrestling and grappling and all my children were there. Even some that have already passed or moved on to other homes, I should say. As they would pile on to me, I would have to fight my way back out. And the whole time Robin was there cheering us on, clapping and encouraging us all on to victory. We are quite a rough and tumble family. 
and it was the perfect image to keep me from closing my eyes. It was what I needed to see. The interesting thing was in these numerous visions, I could clearly see that I was paralyzed. However, I was still able to have fun and interact with my wonderful family. It gave me the truest sense of peace I have ever felt in my life. I knew I would make it out of that hole, and I knew that I would come out paralyzed, and yet none of that mattered. It was that recurring vision, as well as the family and friends, and a few sheriff deputies, who maintained vigil for me at the top of that mine shaft, never letting me rest, nor close my eyes, nor accept defeat in any way. Robin continually kept asking me about my status, and the last thing in the world I wanted to do was upset her more. However, for the sake of rescuers who were en route to my location from three different counties, I knew I had to give it to her straight, just as I had received it. At that time, I had no way of knowing that at the exact time of my fall, Rusty's family was coping and enduring with his memorial service. I also had no idea at the time that it would be another ten and a half long hours before rescuers would be able to arrive, set up all their gear, and then work their way down to me. I later learned from one of the rescuers that at the time they were headed in my direction, they were all collectively hoping and praying I could make it long enough to be considered a rescue as opposed to a body recovery. Jump ahead six years. After being expertly plucked from the bottom of that 93-foot shaft, by the all-volunteer group of the Indian Wells Valley Search and Rescue Team, as well as two other local mine rescue teams, I was flown by helicopter to Loma Linda Medical Center, where they immediately told me I would have to lose my leg and that I would never walk again. It was with some of the first words the doctor said to me. Over the next few months, I endured one surgery after another as the surgeons tried their best to save my leg and back, which suffered an L1 burst fracture from the impact of landing squarely on my feet after such a high fall. It was as if every bone in my body had sustained some form of injury or another. Surgeons even removed three of my back ribs, an entire section of my wrist, this entire artery, and two parts of my thighs just to be able to harvest and use the bones and muscles and veins to be able to use as replacement parts for all the damaged bones that had to be removed from my left foot. The only problem was I later found out I really needed those ribs to keep my intestines and bowels from herniating, which they do at six or more inches outside my back, where those three ribs used to hold everything into place. Let me tell you, that herniating of my bowels and intestines is causing severe pain and severe problems with my ability to have successful bowel movements and be a normal person. That unforeseen problem would definitely come back to haunt me in a few years and would require more surgeries to repair. It wasn't long before the hordes of doctors and surgeons and everyone else began to visit my room on a nearly daily basis trying to explain to me that I would never walk again and had virtually no hope whatsoever of ever fully recovering or ever returning to my beloved job as a sheriff investigator. Let me tell you, it only took a few moments for my lovely wife to quite physically throw each and every surgeon, doctor, nurse, and therapist who had nothing but negative to say straight out of my room. She literally banned them from my room. Robin would not even consider the permanency of my situation. She refused to allow any doctor to discuss with me anything other than what it would take to get me back up and walking again. How soon is it going to take? And why is it taking so long? She kept yelling at them, don't steal his hope. It's all he has left. Chop, chop, damn it, get it done. That's my wife. Three months after my fall, I was transferred from Loma Linda's intensive care unit to a neighboring residential rehabilitation center where I spent several weeks learning how to live my life as a paraplegic that the many surgeons and doctors had said I would be. Returning home several weeks later, I found that my family, my community, 
My coworkers and many others had all worked tirelessly, sometimes throughout the wee hours of the morning, just setting up and preparing for my wheelchair arrival. As for my career and the potential to someday return back to work, Robin never wavered, never even for a single moment, in constantly assuring me that I would walk again and I would most definitely return back to work again someday. From the very day of my accident, she has truly been my rock and my foundation. Where I felt like I needed to just accept my bleak situation and make the most out of the simple fact that I had survived such a horrific accident, she would not let me feel one ounce of pity for myself and she drove me just as hard as I needed to be driven. Years of law enforcement training as well as my decades spent in the Army had instilled within me the fact that at least in some cases such as my own, my continued survival would depend entirely and completely upon my willingness to face every single challenge in my life as if I had already beaten them. To laugh at the naysayers and challenge their convictions and their beliefs about what the human body, mind, and spirit can endure and recover from. My will to survive had to remain unwavering, and while my fight for life began at the bottom of that mine ventilation shaft, it had really only just begun. I lived that life as a paraplegic for about the next 10 months, until one day Robin's never-ending mantra of, trust me, you'll be walking again in no time at all, finally came true. On December 23, 2006, I took my first few tentative steps, I think three in all. However, the way Robin and the kids and family reacted, you would have thought I had single-handedly discovered the cure for cancer and world peace all in one day. Two weeks later, to unbelievably loud and thunderous applause, I walked the entire length of our platform at the church we belonged to at the time, and it truly made for one huge Christmas miracle. Just 15 short months after my fall, I even had recovered enough and become strong enough to return back to work full-time as a sheriff investigator, although my department did have to do a bit of shuffling around to find a position for someone with what were at the time some pretty substantial limitations. Running, jumping, heavy lifting, and taking suspects into custody were all definitely off the roster for the time being. But my department was there for me every step of the way. Due to my limitations, I was moved from my position as a sex crimes and child abuse investigator to working on background investigations for prospective new employees. Either way, I was back to work. I felt like I had overcome everything the world had to throw at me, and I was truly happy. Despite the lingering, terrible pains in my back and left leg, I was doing what I loved for the department I loved. All was good with the world, at least for nine short months. One day, while back at work as a background investigator, I started to notice that getting up and down the stairs and even just walking around the complex was becoming increasingly difficult, bordering on impossible. I would try and be the first one there and the last one to leave just so none of the other deputies and investigators would notice just how much pain I was in. But I was definitely fighting a losing battle. They could see the agony in my eyes and there was no getting away from it. The pain in my left foot that had undergone so many surgeries to repair was quickly failing. I was literally breaking bones almost on a daily basis in my foot because the bones were dying due to lack of oxygen and blood that were not getting to the foot. The pain in my left foot got so bad that doctors made several attempts to fuse the ankle and foot hoping that by stabilizing them the pain would recede somewhat. Unfortunately, repeated, repeated bouts of MRSA continually stole away any progress I could possibly make. I believe I went through five different bouts of MRSA. I quickly realized I was losing all normal sensation in that foot, only to be replaced by ever increasing amounts of pain. The foot looked truly grotesque from all the past surgeries. It was always icy cold and I was quickly losing all external sensations. Inside the foot, what I was feeling was a whole other story. Inside the foot, I felt a constant state of near panic caused by the horrific pain I was suffering through. 
I literally felt like my foot was dying and rotting from the inside out. However, I felt like I could not slow down nor tell my supervisors since my continued return to work was already on pretty thin ice. Finally, I knew something was terribly wrong and I made an appointment to see one of my many surgeons. They determined that the only course of action at that moment was to amputate my left leg and they performed the amputation the very following morning. I went into my surgical appointment that morning without a single ounce of fear or trepidation. I was ready and I didn't hesitate for a moment to say let's do it after the doctor told me what he had found, what I had already suspected. However, seeing the devastation on the x-rays really truly confirmed what I already knew. The leg had to go immediately. By then, just 25 months after my accident, that leg, foot and ankle had been causing me so many problems and so much pain, I was actually relieved to see it go. And besides, it wasn't like I wouldn't be getting a great prosthetic and it wasn't like my department didn't give me every indication that they would be happy to bring me back into the fold as soon as I was physically capable. Unfortunately, I had no way of knowing at the time that I had not yet even begun to endure pain. At that point in my life, even after everything I had been through, I still had no idea what I was in for and just how bad and dark my life was going to soon become. After the loss of my leg, I literally threw myself into my rehabilitation just as I had done previously after breaking my back. Learning how to walk again after already going through the same type of rehab just 10 months after my initial accident was quite an experience. I had no doubt in my mind though that I, if I had already overcome a broken back and paralysis as well as my countless other injuries that this would be a cakewalk. I calculated it should only be a few months before I'd be able to return to work. I was at the best hospital in California. I had access to the best surgeons the best doctors and definitely the best rehabilitation specialists and physical therapists. I knew I would make yet another full recovery and return back to work again and I knew it with everything that was in me and yet I was dead wrong. I was definitely wrong with how long it would take me to get used to my new prosthetic limb. Thankfully I had a great team of doctors and family helping me adjust to my new situation. Within a few months, I was up and walking again like it was nobody's business. However, despite my success with my new leg, I was beginning to experience unbelievable severe back and stomach problems that nearly destroyed the next four years of my life. Years of taking every kind of hardcore pain medication available had been destroying my stomach, my teeth, and ultimately my health. <coughs> I got weaker and weaker, at one point losing nearly half my body mass from a muscular 250 pounds to a frail and weak 128 pounds. My life and my body were truly spiraling out of control. Each and every time I got sick, it was so much worse than the time before. I spent countless hours in local emergency rooms begging for help. I had more extended hospital stays than I ever cared to remember only to be handed each time some new and improved type of NSAID medication. Morphine, Norco, Methadone, Fentanyl, Tizanidine, Neurontin, Baclofen. I've tried every one of them and many, many, many more. I've used these prescribed medications with varying degrees of success and many different degrees of failure, including the loss of half my teeth, the destruction of my stomach, which is now filled with ulcers and lesions, and according to my GI specialist, will most likely require its own surgical procedure to repair. But first things first, we've got to take care of my back. Now, jump ahead again to today. Due to my ongoing stomach problems, which are exacerbated by my inability to have a normal bowel movement due to lingering paralysis in certain areas, and I know all you paras and quads know exactly what I'm saying and where I'm coming from. I now find myself literally backed up for days at a time before I can finally experience even a partial bowel movement. Gross stuff I know, TMI, but this is the everyday life that other paraplegics and quadriplegics have to deal with every single day. 
I spent 10 years in the Army and 13 years in law enforcement, and I really thought I had a good understanding of what it would be like to be in one of those positions. However, nothing in the world could have prepared me for all the changes I would soon have to endure in my life. There are so many things people don't realize about paraplegics and quadriplegics, and let me tell you, it's not fun, it's not easy, it's work every moment of every day. But all of that pales in comparison to my new situation with my back. Now as of today, June 19th, 2012, my L1 spinal fusion that was put in my spine back in 2006 has now nearly completely failed. I've been nearly 100% bedridden for the past eight months awaiting approval for a back surgery that my insurance has dragged their feet on for years. I can't necessarily say I blame them considering my medical bills since 2006 have topped out in the many, many millions of dollars. But come on, the x-rays, the CTs, the scans, and all the other tests show that I must have this surgery immediately before more damage is caused by the four inch long bolts, two of which have now worked themselves nearly completely free of my spine. Latest x-rays show that one of the bolts, the lower left, has almost definitely come completely loose of my back and is now floating free. Eight days in a wake-up call. That's where I'm at today. I have a new spinal surgery scheduled for the 28th of this month with the Hyder Spinal Center located right here in the Inland Empire. So I now have a new surgical team, one that I'm even more confident with than my previous group of surgeons. And let me tell you, that says a lot. The surgeons are expecting a minimum of a full day or more in the surgical suite with me, but they have their plans and they really seem to know exactly what I need to start feeling better and living life again. Heck, after more than seven months stuck lying in bed, only getting up for doctor's appointments, my thoughts, my fears, alone in that bed all that time, all by myself, I am truly ready for whatever step might happen to be next. The surgeons won't give me a percentage of probability of ever walking again. However, they do seem confident. In spite of how bad my back has become, I truly am at peace with my situation. With my family's help and support, I've made it this far, well more than six years beyond the date that I probably should have died. Like Robin always says to me, I'd rather have you paralyzed and with me than to be a widow with 10 children. Even if my back is ruined and unfixable, I am at peace. I have lived the life of a paraplegic before, even if only for 10 months. But I now know that with family, friends, lots of love and support, that no obstacle is unsurpassable, no mountain is unmovable. So, for those of you still in the thick of it, whether it be regular citizens, other law enforcement officers, fire and rescue personnel, or our brave fighting soldiers overseas. Whoever you are, wherever you are, lost in your own world of pain and suffering, I understand, I feel your pain, and yet I know you can overcome it and get back to some semblance of normal life. Things might be different, but you must make the most, the most of it. Sometimes, that really is all we can ask for, one more day to keep breathing. Then, it's up to the individual what to do with that extra time. Whether they're going to waste it, waste their gift of more time on self-pity, or whether they decide to work their butts off and make themselves better people, and hopefully even reach out to other soldiers and citizens in the community who might also need help, love, encouragement, and most of all, support. Now. For those fellow soldiers, National Guardsmen, Marines, Airmen, Sailors, and Reservists who have already come home, and for those of you who will continue to come home with injuries, both physical and psychological, let me tell you, it does get better. You do adjust, you can adapt, and you will survive. Just hang in there, guys. It's going to take a while. And yes, I'm already six years into my recovery, but I can finally see the light at the end of the tunnel. I know my good times are coming. Do I know what the outcome of my upcoming surgery will be? No. Will I ever walk again? 
I really can't say. But what I do know is that whatever obstacles life chooses to throw my way next, I will be able to survive, adapt, and overcome. But more than just survive, I plan to thrive. I'm alive and it would be an absolute waste of time, resources, and energy to do anything other than work my butt off and expect miracles. Because when it's miracles you expect, it's miracles you shall receive. I do plan on making a follow-up video to this one once I have had my surgeries and I'm back up and walking again because that's the only option I'm willing to consider at that point. My next video might show me in a wheelchair, it might show me up and walking, but you know what? There's going to be another video because I will continue to thrive. So, if you're interested in what you've seen, if this has caught your attention in some way, if this reminds you of somebody special that you're worried about, please send this video to them. Whether they're a soldier, a citizen, whoever they are. Especially, though, if you do know any soldiers who could use a little pep talk and a swift kick in the butt to get them up and moving, please send this video to them. They might seem perfectly normal and well-adjusted, but unless you've been a soldier and sent to a foreign country where you had to fight and kill to survive, all while seeing things that no young adult should ever have to see. They might seem perfectly normal on the outside, but their hearts and souls could be literally breaking to pieces on the inside due to what they've seen, done, heard, and experienced during combat. Some wounds, especially the ones on the inside, could take years to heal. And without love and support, what is that person to do? Everyone needs a little helping hand once in a while. I hope that having heard just a fraction of what I've gone through might serve as an encouragement for others to get up and do whatever it takes to get them back to a normal, safe, and content life. So please pass this around. Give people hope. There is a way through every situation. You just have to make the effort and believe that you can adapt, adjust, and overcome. You have to expect miracles. You just have to be willing to stay the course, fight for every tiny step of progress you make, and whatever you do, don't be down on yourself when you just can't do some of the things you used to do. That's a fact of life. That's called adjusting. Give it time. Be patient, and you will overcome your situation. I look forward to making a second video showing me post-surgery up and walking again as if nothing ever happened. And if I do come out of my surgery paralyzed again, I am ready for that. When I was previously a paraplegic, I still made every effort to go out with all the kids, bombing our way through the desert on our quads and toys. We still went out boating as a family. We still would go out riding our sea doos at the lake and the local rivers. And most of all, I was still able to enjoy every second I had with my wife and children. So whatever you do, if you haven't learned or heard anything else that I've said, stay strong, stay the course, and know in your heart things will get better. I look forward to seeing you all again when I'm back up and walking. Thank you very much for watching this video. Please comment and I will do my best to comment back to anybody who has relevant information to share. Thank you all, and have a wonderful day.